Remember the old Buck Showalter saying of, I like our guys? Well, apparently it has made its way to the Brandon Hyde era because the Orioles on Monday night brought back an old friend signing Michael Gibbons to a one-year $5 million contract to bolster their bullpen. I'll break down the signing, what kind of pitcher Gibbons is now, and how he will help the Orioles coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Tuesday, December 20th, 2022. And welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we break down the Orioles' third big league signing of the offseason as they had added a starting pitcher, they had added an infielder, and now, something we thought they might do, they have added a veteran reliever. And it's someone the Orioles know well, as the O's announced a one-year, $5 million major league contract with 32-year-old right-hander Michael Givens in the deal on Monday night. Now, specifically, the Orioles have not announced the deal yet, still pending a physical, but first reported by Robert Murray of Fansided and others tweeting about it and confirming it with their sources that Gibbons is coming back to Baltimore. Now, I get the question of, well, the Orioles had a top five bullpen last year for most of the year, finished with a top 10 bullpen. Why are they addressing that need? Well, we'll get to that a little later, but when you have that many rookies, you got to get some vets in there to make sure guys don't all fall apart at the same time. But we're going to break down Gibbons' career with the O's a bit, his last couple of years since the Orioles traded him away. And we'll look at why he is still a good piece in the bullpen and why the O's brought him back. Talk about just, you know, Michael Gibbons, the full picture as well. Then we'll chat about how he fits into the Orioles' bullpen, which definitely has some spots up for grabs. We'll talk about where his stuff is at now. And then chat about what the Orioles need to do next because they also have to clear a 40-man spot for Michael Givens, but that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. Before we get there, though, just did want to thank you for making Locked On Orioles your first podcast listen of the day, free and available on all podcast listening platforms. And of course, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked On Orioles YouTube channel. I know I did say when I left you on Monday with that episode that you can expect us back Wednesday and Thursday this week. And generally, as the pod is now down to three episodes a week, generally I'll be with you Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. But we're in the off season when you get breaking news, the Orioles make a signing. I will be in your ears that next morning. And here we are on a Tuesday talking about Michael Gibbons. So let's start with Gibbons. We know Orioles fans know him well, but who is he now? Because it's been a couple years. Well, Michael Givens now 32 years old. He'll be 33 in the middle of next season, next June. And the Orioles signed him to a one-year $5 million contract, which also holds a mutual option for the 2024 season. Now, to start with that, mutual options basically never get picked up. I believe the last one in Major League Baseball to get picked up was by Matt Belisle and the Rockies, I think in 2013 was the last time a mutual option was picked up. So Trey Mancini, for example, had a mutual option this year. They don't get picked up. They're just a way to maybe get a little more money. So the base salary is going to be $3 million for Givens. If he declines his option, he'll make a $1 million buyout next year. If he accepts and the Orioles decline, he'll get $2 million on the buyout. And then, of course, if they both accept, he'll be back for next season and the 2024 number would be $6 million he would make if they both accepted the offer. But again, mutual options basically never get accepted on both sides. So he will be a free agent after the 2023 season. And thanks to Mark Feinsand of LB.com, who did all the reporting, first reporting there on all of those financial numbers. There are also apparently some incentives in terms of his numbers and his innings pitched, his appearances, performance bonuses as well, all baked in to that contract. But Michael Givens, you know, we haven't seen him in a little while. Of course, he was originally an Oriole, second round pick of the O's all the way back in 2009 out of high school when the Orioles drafted him as a shortstop. And he was in their system for a few years as a hitter before the Orioles transitioned him over to the mound because the bat just was not there, but they knew the guy had an arm and an interesting delivery. And that sidearm delivery took him through the minor leagues much quicker than his bat ever did. And then Gibbons all of a sudden 
found himself as a big league relief pitcher after being drafted out of high school as a shortstop. Makes his major league debut in 2015 with the Orioles and down the stretch with the O's that year at age 25, 30 innings and a 1.80 ERA. And the Orioles said, "Eh, we might have found something with this guy Givens. So he comes back in 2016 is a huge part of that Oriole bullpen, which kind of dragged them to the wild card game in 2016, had a 3-1-3 ERA in 74 and two thirds innings. Then in 2017, pitched a career high 78 and two thirds innings, had a 2-7-5 ERA, just continued to be great. You know, he fell off a little bit in 2018, still threw about 77 innings, but his ERA was just below four. Then in 2019, you know, things kind of got weird. He started playing for just a really, really terrible team. He kind of became the closer. He saved 11 games in 2019, but he had a four, five, seven ERA that year with the O's. Then in 2020, he starts the year with Baltimore and kind of gets back to the pitcher. We had seen the few years prior and in that shortened 2020 season makes 12 appearances and in 13 innings has a 1.38 ERA and the Orioles go ahead and trade him. They deal him to the Colorado Rockies for a return of Taryn Vavra, Tyler Nevin, and Michelle Desson, three hitting prospects coming back to the O's. And funny enough, you know, Vavra and Nevin, currently on the 40-man roster, both were in the big leagues this year. Desson had a little bit of a down year in the minors, but Orioles still think highly of him in the system. And now we're looking at a good chance of Givens and Vavra being teammates and maybe less likely for Tyler Nevin, who may have missed his chance, but there's always a chance Nevin stays in the system and, you know, probably gets back to the big leagues this year. All three of them could be teammates at some point in 2023. If we didn't know this already, I think you can pretty easily say the Orioles won the Michael Givens trade. Now, after that half season with Colorado, he did come back to the Rockies. He still had 2021 under contract and pitched well and then got traded by Colorado at the 2021 deadline to the Reds where he struggled a bit down the stretch with Cincinnati and then became a free agent his 2021 season 51 innings and a 3.35 ERA but the strikeouts were a little down stuff was not the same but he signed with the Cubs last offseason and did have a bit of a bounce back With Chicago, 40 and two-thirds innings pitch with the Cubs, a 2-6-6 ERA, and he got dealt to the Mets at the trade deadline. Mets were looking for bullpen help. Of course, Buck Showalter, their manager, knew Givens very well. He wanted Givens. They went and got him, but he just wasn't the same down the stretch. 20 and two-thirds innings for the Mets had a 4.79 ERA down the stretch for New York and really wasn't a factor for them super late in the year as one of their high leverage relievers. But overall for Givens 2022 season, it was 59 appearances, a 61 and a third innings pitched, a 3.38 ERA with a 3.96 FIP on the year. It had 27% strikeout rate and a walk rate just a touch below 10% as well. And for Givens though, although those weren't the greatest numbers of his career and it was a little bit ugly down the stretch for the Mets, his strikeout percentage this season which was 27%, over 27%, was his highest since 2017 with the Orioles. And his walk percentage was his lowest since 2018 with the Orioles. So the stuff was looking a little better. The command was looking a little better for Michael Givens. And overall, it seemed like he still had his stuff going. Now, he's generally the same kind of pitcher that he was back then. He's a guy who is going to get righties out at a much higher clip then he is going to get lefties out Had a 28% K rate against righties this year. They hit just 233 against him. Lefties hit 273 against him. He actually doubled his walk rate 14% against lefties than it was against righties. Just doesn't have that out pitch against left-handers at times, but a very, very effective reliever against right-handed batters. And the big thing for Gibbons, you know, he had those tough numbers with the Mets, but he came over at the deadline. And in August, he was horrible. Strikeout rate was down. ERA was over eight. But down the stretch for New York in September and October, he didn't pitch much because, you know, a little bit of an injury and the Mets weren't really trusting him. But in September and October, eight and a third innings pitched, no runs, six hits, 10 Ks and three walks really, really finished his season strong with New York. And that allowed him to come back to Baltimore on that free agent deal here this offseason. Now, in terms of what he throws on the mound, it's pretty much the same stuff. When he was with the Orioles, the fastball slider and changeup combination that we saw here in Baltimore. Again, the fastball is good, but 
it's kind of been the pitch that's gone away from him a little bit over the past couple of years. He's lost velocity on that fastball. His average four seam fastball velocity was just 93.4 miles per hour this year. If you take us back to 2019, he was throwing it at 95.3 miles per hour on average. So he lost two ticks on his fastball in the last three years. And that pitch is now kind of the pitch that gets hit. Opponents hit 287 against it this year, 293 against it last year. He still throws it about 52% of the time and likes to throw that pitch up in the zone because of his sidearm arm slot. It gives the pitch some, some rise like it does for submarine pitchers, and he does get some swing and miss, but it's not the same pitch. However, on the plus side, his slider has gotten better since he left the Orioles. Now, he basically only throws the slider to right-handers. He only threw 32 sliders to left-handed batters all season, but it really does get the righties out. That pitch still right around, you know, 87 miles per hour. Again, it's a little bit slower than he threw it with the Orioles, but it's made it more effective. Opponents hit just 203 against his slider this year, and in 2021, they hit just 129 against his slider. It's a devastating pitch against righties. And then against lefties, he still goes to that changeup. It was a pitch that he always had in the big leagues, but he was always a little afraid to go to it. And, you know, for most of this, his time with the Orioles, he threw that changeup less than 10% of the time. Well, he trusts that changeup a lot more, which has really allowed him to stay in the big leagues. He now throws that change about 19% of the time. It's still his third most used pitch, but at 82 miles per hour, it kind of dips down and away from the left-handers. Again, he throws it mostly to lefties. And opponents hit just 220 against that changeup this year. It actually has his highest whiff rate at 29%. So it's definitely an effective pitch, and it's much more effective than it was in Baltimore. So again, changeup's better, slider's better. Fastball is definitely worse, but he is still an effective reliever. All three of his pitches have, have over a 26% whiff rate. So he's not a crazy big strikeout guy, but he's still getting more than a strikeout per inning, and he's still an effective reliever who the Orioles can use in, in certainly many many different situations. Now, of course, to tell the entire story of Michael Givens, you need to tell the entire story. He was with the Orioles for a long time, has played for a few different teams in Colorado and Cincinnati and Chicago and New York since then. But shortly before the Orioles traded him at the deadline in 2020, back in March of 2020, there were some disturbing allegations made against Michael Givens. His then wife, Tiffany, posted on Facebook back in March of 2020, accusing him of, quote, stalking her, stealing from her, breaking into their house and stealing things and sending abusive messages. And she accused him of doing this in front of their children as well. The two would shortly after that get divorced. I believe they were even you know, in the process of getting divorced right around that time before the 2020 season. Now, Michael Givens did come out and, quote, vehemently deny those allegations, they are now divorced. And, you know, we have really not heard anything, at least publicly, about that story since then. Givens was never suspended by Major League Baseball under their domestic violence policy. He has pitched in the big leagues since that moment, you know, even pitched from opening day of that shortened 2020 season as well. But, you know, it's important to not gloss over those things that happen off the field as well. And that is part of the story of Michael Givens that the Orioles are bringing in. But the Orioles, you know, assessing everything that goes in with Michael Givens, looking through the numbers, looking through the past, they bring him in on a one-year, $5 million deal. Now, they do have to figure out as well, how's he going to fit in with this bullpen? Because this is a unit that pitched incredibly well last year, and some would argue they don't need any help. Well, coming up next, I'll talk about why the Orioles needed a veteran reliever to at least give this bullpen a little bit of insurance heading into 2023. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by betonline.net, which is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis this December. Now, the World Cup is over, and it was an amazing final between Argentina getting the victory over France, Messi get, finally getting that first World Cup title, and everything that goes with the World Cup this year was over as well. But still plenty of sporting events going on. Of course, we got college football bowl season rolling on this week. You've got the NFL action every single weekend. Hopefully, Lamar Jackson comes back for the Ravens. Plus, there's college basketball. There's the NBA. There's the NHL. And all the lines, all the odds for every game, 
They've got it at betonline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, which I hope you do, if you're listening to this one, you can even find those at Bet Online as well. They're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more at Bet Online, where the game starts. So the Orioles on Monday deciding to bring back one of their former Orioles in Michael Givens on a one-year $5 million deal with a mutual option for the 2024 season as well. So the next question becomes, what does this mean for the Orioles bullpen? Because as we've talked about, the O's had a top five bullpen in 2022. For most of the season, they had a top five bullpen. Now, Guys got tired. Guys had never pitched a full season. Things kind of fell apart a bit in September and October. They still finished in the bottom part of the top 10, but they were legitimately a top five bullpen for 80% of the season. That was, you could argue, the biggest reason why the O's were in the playoff hunt until the end of the year. They had guys pitching incredibly, rookies pitching insanely well. And you get to a point where you feel really good about that unit. However... I think we would mostly agree that there are only four spots really locked in to the Orioles' bullpen right now in terms of guys we know are going to be relievers. Those would be Felix Bautista, CNL Perez, Dylan Tate, and Brian Baker. Now, Bautista, Perez, and Tate were kind of the big three all season. Baker had a roller coaster year, but finished incredibly strong, showed off the stuff, got that command together. I think Baker is also a lock for the bullpen next year. Now, any of those guys, I mean, Probably not Bautista, but any of the other three, especially Perez or Tate, I still think could be traded this offseason. I wouldn't like it, but it could happen. Kind of similar to the Tanner Scott and Cole Saucer to the Marlins deal that the Orioles did just before opening day last year. It could happen to kind of capitalize on the peak value of a volatile young reliever. But if it doesn't happen, those four guys are locked in. Now, you're signing Michael Givens to a one-year $5 million deal an MLB contract. He's been in the big leagues. He's been in Baltimore. That is locking in a bullpen spot to Michael Gibbons. So now you have five spots that are sewn up and you only have eight spots in the bullpen. Remember, you can only carry 13 pitchers on the 26 man roster. You have five starters. Now you have five locked in on the bullpen. So you only have three spots left. And now let's assume that the Orioles right now, as we're speaking, don't add another starting pitcher. Now I hope they do. They've been connected to Michael Waka and Rich Hill as I'm talking about in this Orioles trade target series, I hope they can maybe trade for a better starting pitcher than that this off season. But I think they still should and could add another starter. But if they don't, their rotation would look something like Tyler Wells, Grayson Rodriguez, Kyle Gibson, Kyle Bradish, and Dean Kramer. So anyone below that would also fall into a bullpen role. So that leaves Austin Voth and DL Hall in the bullpen mix as well. And if those two guys are with the team still, you know, if Voth doesn't get traded or anything like that, or if Hall doesn't start the year in AAA, which I hope he wouldn't, they're going to be on the roster too. So I I give a bullpen spot to Austin Voth and DL Hall if they don't have a rotation spot. So right there, you're looking at 12 of your 13 pitchers locked up. And if the Orioles add another starter, that person's going to have a spot locked up too, that would probably move Tyler Wells into the bullpen. And there's your whole pitching staff right there, which makes this really intriguing because in theory, in theory, if the Orioles were to add another starting pitcher, and again, everyone wants and hopes that they do, they're kind of set with their pitching staff. Now there could be injuries. You never know in spring training that opens up a spot. Again, could be a trade happening, especially with one of these relievers. Like I I do think CNL Perez might be traded, but it's kind of locked up right now. And you got these other names. You've got, you know, all these guys on the 40 man, Noah Denoyer, Logan Gillespie, Keegan Aiken, you know, was on the team most of the year last year. You, Joey Crable on the team most of the year, Nick Vespi, Mike Bauman, Yenny Cano, Spencer Watkins, and, you know, a couple, couple other guys like, like Drew Rahm are in that mix as well. Chris Valamont and Andrew Politi, the rule five pick, even in that group. And none of those guys would have a spot. Specifically, Crable, Aiken, Vespi, Politi, that would be tough to, to cut those guys, especially Politi. You know, you'd have to send him back to the Red Sox because he was a Rule 5 pick. So it does lead me to believe with the Orioles making this signing, it makes me believe two things. One, I think the O's are going to trade one of their relievers. 
And I've said this before on the pod. I think it's going to be CNL Perez. Now, Michael Gibbons gets righties out at a much better rate. So maybe you wouldn't want to lose a guy who gets lefties out, but Perez is kind of a pretty even splits guy. And CNL Perez had the biggest discrepancy between his actual ERA and his expected ERA in all of baseball last year. His actual ERA was under two. His expected ERA was around four. He got very, very lucky. He was still good. Don't get me wrong. And I love Perez, but he got lucky. And I could see the O's trying to capitalize on that value. But again, if they bring in another starting pitcher, they're kind of set here. And some of these guys are getting DFA or going to AAA or getting returned to their old teams in the in the you know spot of Andrew Politi. So it's interesting. But I would also understand the argument. You know, why are you bringing in a reliever like Givens then? If you feel like the bullpen's pretty much locked up, why would you give a spot to Givens and push out Vespi or push out Aiken or push out Gillespie or Crable or Mike Bauman or whoever it may be? Well. Here's the thing, especially if you can hold on to a lot of those guys like I just mentioned, because most of these guys on the 40-man roster I talked about, although they might not have a spot on the opening day roster, pretty much all of them have major league options left, which means they can be sent down to AAA without going through waivers and stay in the organization and stay on the 40-man. So you can keep them as good depth in AAA. Because listen, as good as Felix Bautista and CNL Perez and Brian Baker were last year, and, and even Austin Voth, you know, and, and Joey Crable for a good stretch and, and Keegan Aiken for a good stretch, as good as those guys were, all those guys were unproven. I mean, really, the only proven guy in the bullpen right now before the Givens deal was Dylan Tate. He had shown a couple of seasons before this year that he could be a good reliever in the big leagues. Everybody else is pretty much on their first full MLB season in the bullpen. And although they all pitched well, you saw what happened to guys like Keegan Aiken and Joey Crable at the end of the year. They really, really fell off because they weren't used to that kind of stretch. And also, maybe they had kind of been lucky, kind of gotten all their good pitching out, whatever it may be. It gave a little glimpse into you can't trust that many rookies. And you can usually find veteran relievers at the deadline, and maybe the O's could have done that if they needed help. But why do that when you can bring in a fairly cheap option to Michael Givens for $5 million, a guy you know a lot about, has been in the organization, heck, was here when Mike Elias and his staff and Brandon Hyde were all here in 2019 and, and half of 2020 as well, a known commodity versus there's a lot about Perez and Baker and Crable and Vespi and Voth that are still unknown. So this gives you insurance to all those young rookie or second-year relievers. Michael Givens, he's 32. He's been in your organization for a long time before he got traded. You know what you're getting out of Michael Givens. You're still getting you know, a, a three to three and a half ERA, a guy who's going to pitch 60 to 70 innings. He can you know, pitch in the fifth. He can pitch in the ninth if you need him to. And he's done it for your organization before. It is that insurance you need. Because if CNL Perez has a four ERA, through the end of April, you've got Givens there to slide into that eighth inning role. If Brian Baker looks like kind of mid-season Brian Baker again, you've got Michael Givens to slide in that seventh inning role. If Felix Bautista goes through a little bit of a tough stretch, Michael Givens could save some games for you. If D.L. Hall is struggling with his command or Austin Voth, it was just one lucky half season and he turns into the pitcher he was with the Nats again. You have Michael Givens as that steady presence in the bullpen to be the veteran guy to help out the younger relievers, but also just help have some stability and a guy you know you can trust every day out there in that pen. And that's kind of the reasoning. And I like the idea to go at a fairly cheap veteran reliever to this team. Now, for the Orioles, they've gotten their veteran reliever. They've gotten their veteran starting pitcher. They've gotten their veteran infielder all on one-year major league deal. So the question is, what's next? Not only with this exact roster move, but the Orioles offseason as we continue to move forward closer and closer to the new year. Talk about that coming up next. So the Orioles bullpen gets a little more experience, bringing in Michael Givens, bringing him back to Baltimore on a one-year $5 million deal. And as I record here, just after 8 p.m. Eastern time on Monday night, the Orioles have not officially announced the Givens deal, which most likely means the Orioles are doing the physical with Michael Givens, but when they do, the O's will have to make a roster move because the 40-man roster before adding Givens is currently full. After adding Adam Frazier last week, it made it full at 40 people. So the O's are going to have to make a 40-man roster move to clear a spot for Michael Givens because it is 
a major league deal. Now, there are a couple guys on the 40-man roster currently who I would certainly say are on the bubble. Now, you would think that probably it would be a pitcher that would go to add a pitcher, but you never know. And we've talked about a bit kind of who could be on the chopping block, who is on the outskirts of the roster right now. I would say that a guy like Lewin Diaz is probably going to be one of the first to go just because the Orioles only claimed him this off season. You know, they've got a similar answer in Franchi Cordero who they brought in on a minor league deal. You know, maybe they like Diaz enough to stick him around, but he was already going through waivers. I think the O's would try to sneak him back through waivers as well. Beyond Lewin Diaz guys like Tyler Nevin could be in danger just because of how rough His season became in 2022. Bruce Zimmerman, another guy who had a rough year, who maybe could be losing that spot. I think Joey Crable is potentially in a little bit of danger as well. Those are just a couple guys, I think, that could be on the chopping block. I mean, maybe if the O's want to dip down deeper, if they don't think Logan Gillespie is really a piece moving forward, if they're not sold on a guy like Chris Valamont or maybe Spencer Watkins potentially or... Yenier Cano, I mean, any of those guys could potentially be the guy that goes and uh, we'll see what that roster move becomes for the O's. Now, speaking of minor league deals, the Orioles did also bring in three players on Monday on minor league deals, three right-handed pitchers in Edward Bizzardo, in Wandison Charles, and in Kyle Dowdy, all right-handed pitchers. Um, Bizzardo and Dowdy have each had a little bit of major league experience. Uh, Bizzardo actually had some solid experience, a sub three ERA and 12 appearances with the Red Sox last year, but they're all going to be depth, all kind of bullpen arms that'll go to Norfolk and, you know, we'll try to compete for a opening day roster spot. But as I just talked about in the Orioles bullpen, especially after adding Givens, the, uh, open spots are certainly dwindling at the moment. So the O's are going to have to make a 40 man roster move. Most likely by the time you're listening to this Tuesday, they probably already made that move. But again, there's a lift of guys that could be on the chopping block. And then next up, hopefully a starting pitcher. If it's a signing, it's probably going to be Waka or Hill. If it's not, I mean, hopefully they can swing a big trade and go get a big time starter. They'll get a backup catcher as well. We do know that's going to happen. I mean, maybe the answer is Anthony Bamboom, but I would think they're going to bring in some sort of veteran backup catcher on a cheap one-year deal to back up Adley Rushman. I think the big thing is, of course, trading for those starting pitchers. And we'll continue to talk about potential trades for starting pitchers coming up later in the week. We'll be back on Thursday for the final episode of this week. Unless the O's make another signing, then we'll be back before then here on the pod. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.